So welcome to the Wednesday webinar. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. I'm um, sorry we're a little bit late on starting. Uh, tonight we're going to talk a lot about passive investing, but we have a few things that we want to go over first before we get started. So we are going to be live in just a second on Facebook. So smile, make sure you look like you're having fun and learning lots of information. So this is an educational series. So the disclaimer is that you still need to consult your own professionals, get your own financial advice, any legal counsel. Um, our goal here is to share what we believe, what we know, what we think is true, um, but always verify and trust anything that you learn or get to know. So um, here we're gonna go, get into it now. Who's Massive Capital? Gonna talk a little bit about what we're doing. So on the Massive Capital is a vertically integrated real estate company specialized in ground up construction, retail, flex space, industrial and mixed use multifamily. We're also an owner operator for value add multifamily assets. You look on the left hand side, we do equity brokerage on the triple net retail and industrial space. Same with the property management, development, construction, both in metal and in wood. So those are different things. And then we have an education program. And tonight we're gonna to be meeting Alex, who's helping us with that. If you look at the map, we are very Texas centric. So we have a lot of assets in Texas, but we do have two assets in Denver, Colorado, two assets in North Carolina, and two assets in Georgia. We have partnered with Realty One that has about $290 million in assets. So 500, uh, sorry, 500 square feet of retail and about 250,000, yeah, 500,000 square feet, I'll be all right. Yeah, uh, 250,000 of a retail center. Massive Capital itself has about 1,300 units, 175 million, and we're developing the X space that is being built in Houston right now. So we can get to the next slide, Mike. So this is the Massive Capital team. So across the top of the folks that you will deal with on a regular basis, myself and the investor relations, Jasmine, Maria, Candace, Aska, there's Jonathan, who's in our legal, Brenda, who helps us here. And tonight you're going to be introduced to Alex and Rishma, who actually just started a couple of days ago. And then across the bottom, you'll see some of the folks that are part of our support team. Um, Baskar is actually just flying over. He's coming to visit us in the U.S., um, just arrived in the airport, so Mike is multitasking, getting him his ride to his hotel. So we're super excited we're going to be able to meet him in person next week when we're, the Massive Capital team is in Houston. So this is our sponsorship team. So we have Sharar, Sanjay, and Mike from Massive Capital. And on the Realty One side, we have Bo, Alexis, and Pat. So Alex, if you want to quickly introduce yourself. Yeah, sure thing. Hopefully, y'all can see me. Hey, everybody. This is Alex. Um, I'm from Fort Worth, uh, from Houston as well. I was I had a big engineering background in the past. I've worked overseas in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, and then I went to real estate, they mostly wholesaling. And I do a lot of my personal time, as you can see. <laughs> I live in uh, Medellin, Colombia, and at the same time, I'm that guy that's you know giving y'all a call just to kind of see you know how we can help y'all out, just to see you know what y'all's kind of goals are for. Um, Pretty much anything real estate related, and when, especially when it comes to vegan uh, GP, that's definitely the part I can help y'all out on. So, and I think Rimsha could. Yeah, Rimsha, you're next. Hey, everybody. My name is Rimsha. I am the newest addition to Massive Capital. It's like my third day here. So, I have joined the education and events department, and I'm very excited to be here. This is a very new endeavor for me. I have worked in all different sectors of education, classrooms, daycares. Um, I've worked at medical school before, and that actually brought me to Massive Capital. I'm excited to be a part of the education program here, and I'm excited to get the engagement and to see more faces like today. Awesome. Well, welcome. And I know that you can't stay with us tonight, so um, thanks, but thanks for being able to come. I know you've got to go take care of a family situation, but we, we're excited to have you here. It's exciting to see Massive Capital growing. So Alex is going to talk a little bit more about the education program. Okay, so typically the way it works is we have kind of like a 90-day roadmap. So whenever y'all join, you know, depending on where y'all at, if y'all have done kind of real estate in the, in the past or have not done it as much, we go through pretty much everything. We have our daily calls. Everything's recorded. 
And so we have certain kind of uh, assets and, and parts to the program where we make sure that y'all are competent enough to kind of take your own path and figure out if you want to be an investor relations, deal finder, asset management. So, you know, as you can see, you know, we have certain parts like, you know, submitting three commercial LOIs. Uh, we have also the capital raise certification that with uh, family office, uh, family office club. So this is kind of a nationwide thing that we're actually paying uh, yearly for. So you get access to that along with Red IQ and a lot of other softwares that come with it that, you know, that we're, we're offering as part of the mastermind. So, you know, we really do value kind of your time and we always want to make sure that we give you all the most that we can. And this is kind of like what I tell people, this is kind of like a community and like a family. So you're not just a number, you really are here. So we are growing. So get in now before <laughs> this gets massive. So that's what I tell people, hey, you know, this is the time to get in. So, you know, let me know. And I do see some familiar people that I was talking to in the, in the participants. So hi. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm going to throw actually my email in the chat. So if y'all got like any questions or anything, just shoot me an email. I'm always open to talk. Um, so yeah, just let me know if y'all have any questions. You know, I'm here, we're here to help. So yeah, we're super excited to see this program evolve. Uh, we started it um, sort of what second or third month last year. Um, we've got quite a few students. We're super proud of the fact that Massive Capital over its two years of existence has created 18 people to be able to get to GP status. So we're super excited about it. Um, and again, with the addition of Alex and Ramshot, it's really going to help us be able to offer a little bit more in the program um, for, as we grow the program to be a little bit larger. I don't know if you wanted to say anything, Mike, or we can move on to the next slide. No, that's perfect. Thank you, guys. And uh, there's a, you, you know, it's here, black and white, red, purple, whatever the colors are. I'm colorblind. So you got a lot of information there. Uh, Alex, share your uh, link, if you can, in the chat for how people can oh, yeah, yeah. sign yeah, up with a call, man. sign up a call with you. So if anybody's that. interested in this, as we speak. Uh, Go to Alex's calendar link, sign up to book some time, uh, talk through it, learn about it, and uh, get to know us a little more and join us. Perfect. And I also added the link to the coaching program. So, okay, cool, cool. Awesome. So, we are super excited that we're about to have our third virtual conference coming up on February the 16th. For anyone who's joined, I've got a lot of friends who joined and they've been super much enjoyed this conference. It's a full day. And because you came to our webinar tonight, if you use this link, if you want to attend and just get a free ticket, you can put in the code free ticket and you will get a general admission, no charge. And because you're our special friends, if you put in the code webinar, you will get $100 off the VIP ticket which ends up costing you only $49 and you will get access to a little more networking and you will get a copy of all the recordings from the session. So this is not just massive capital. Most of our presentations are, but on this one, we bring experts in in all different areas. So you'll hear all the way across. The agenda will be published very soon and we're super, super excited. It's gonna be a full day. So looking forward to connecting with everybody. So. On the left-hand side, for those of you that have joined, you can see all of the deals that we closed in 2023. We do have two LOIs pending, and we are closing out our San Antonio property. It's a 506C offering, 204 doors. And even though that, that tells you to come to a webinar, the webinar is over with. And uh, we closed on that property last week. If you would like to get any information about this, we would be more than happy to provide it. It's a great opportunity. I'm going to put a little bit of links in the chat here um, that people can get some more information on this particular also, opportunity. Yeah. Also, Trevor, as well, I mean, people can just scan the QR code here. Yes. And uh, get access directly to the deal. So if you scan that QR code, it'll just be a few questions about the same questions as it took to get into the Zoom today and it'll give you access there's no fees no cost no risk to enter the portal uh, then you can look at that deal and other deals that we have with massive capital and we're super excited uh, we managed to get closed and uh 
our interest rate. You know, they never set the rate until right till you do it, and it went down. So we have a blended rate on this property of about 4.6%, uh, which is really good on fixed rate debt. So, and I put a link in there that you can go look at this opportunity. Next slide, Mike. All right, Massive Capital Partnership. We talked a little bit about that. We obviously grow together as a team. Um, so on the left-hand side, we're looking for landowners that want to, um, to be able to partner with us on joint venture. Multifamily, we take care of asset management, CapEx, and credit enhancement. So if you need somebody to do it, um, you get a credit enhancement. And the last slide, Mike, education, which we already talked about. We shared the link. Um, now, Hart is saying that it's asking her for a credit card, even though she doesn't have to pay. So we'll check on that. Okay. Yeah, so here's a couple things at CRM. If you guys want to take a look at this, it basically includes the website. Uh, comes with that, the CRM itself, and a few automations already built in based on what we've done with our CRM and process. And then the same, the accelerator program, the Massive Capital Mastermind that Alex can talk to you about. There's a link here for that. So uh, I'll talk a little, Trevor, on deal yeah. flow and so we can and get into our... So just, you know, one of the things that we've been changing and working on is building out our deal flow process. So we we now you know work within Monday.com. And uh, so we we do our underwriting within Red IQ, which is a an online platform, SaaS uh, type platform. Uh, high, you know, it's a high subscription rate. So people that join us get access to that. And then we load that through into Monday.com and run through our run it as each project goes through. So through the previous two years, we were looking, we were, we underwrote about $5.6 billion the previous two years. And then so far in 24, we've underwritten about a billion dollars of assets. So just, it's more of an indicator to we're looking again, you were going to underlight, we're going to kiss a lot of frogs, whatever that is to get to the, to the good deals. Um, but it just gives an idea of where we're going, how we're tracking, and the opportunity that's there with the deal flow that we're creating. All righty. Hey, and I see some, I also see a lot of good friends here that I hadn't seen as for a while. And Mr. Owl on here. So great. See y'all. Uh, we're going to talk now a bit into real estate investing fundamentals, the market rent growth, and assumptions of like new debt, uh, as loan assumption versus new debt. And investor economics, a uh, little bit on that. Some of the things when we're thinking about the markets and rent growth and just, you know, what's going on, right? We we look for whether you're doing retail or multifamily, you're you're looking for growth, right? And uh you're you're looking for uh added, you know, more rooftops going up uh as well, but you for like if you're doing retail, but if you're doing multifamily, you're looking for the growth into the area. And that growth into the area drives, okay, I need more, uh, I need more space, I need more uh, units to rent. And that then has either if the if the building process hasn't, you know, caught up, that drives up the the rental rates as well, right? So it's supply and demand, obvious things. Uh, so so as you look into the different, you know, markets, you know, and one of the things we we do and we push like your when you talk about like your buy box and where you want to look to to own, uh, be you know be pretty specific geographic so you can learn that market really well and get to know it and get to know the brokers there, get to know the deals. The neighborhoods be able to, you know, uh, you know, drive it virtually if you, you're not, you know, if you're not in a place that you say, I, I don't really like to invest where I live, but I want to invest in some other places, you know, drive it virtually as much as you can. And then eventually go and visit that area, you know, spend some time in the market, take some time to go drive around it uh, uh, live and, and person as well. Um, so the, the, the things we talked about here is the, you know, that market growth, 
that drives the rent appreciation and and that rent appreciation obviously um you know some of you guys have been around a while but if there's any people new that rent appreciation drives the um value of the property because as we increase the the rent the income goes up the net income goes up assuming that we keep our expenses down and all of that adds directly to the value so if you assume whatever cap rate in that area uh, every dollar you add you know is going to add that you know that portion percentage as as value based on that cap rate uh again as i said stay you know update on these economic indicators you know um look at you know the demographics and the trends that's happening in the area because things will keep changing right and everybody's there's movements happening and people are going to keep moving depending on maybe they don't want to pay insurance uh they love florida but maybe they don't want to pay insurance in florida they uh you know other things will change and happen it'll drive people in different directions uh, as well. Like maybe it's more affordable here than somewhere else for a while. And then that becomes less affordable as more growth goes into that uh, area. So here's, I'm gonna go over a couple uh, graphs um, and take a little time on these and kind of think about these. So the first graphs I have are, are what they call uh, from single family rentals. So they're not uh, multifamily, but we'll see a lot of uh, overlap indications that are very similar. Um, so if you, you know, for the, uh, so these are just different, you know, tiers, but they, they don't, you don't see much variation except, you know, in a few years here, you saw some variation, but, you know, as over the last few years, these, these, Tears all marked pretty close within like about a one, one and a half percent of of each other. And uh, and again, this is this is rental, you know, um by these tiers. So obviously we saw this big peak spike up here and and down, you know, so twenty twenty two was probably about hitting the lowest as far as you know, increases go 23 leveled out and 24 has, you know, we'll see what happens. 24 has probably, you know, what we hear from the feds and stuff and things happening in the economy, it, it's likely to, you know, have an opportunity to continue a bit flat, maybe a bit more up, uh, hopefully, you know, if we're, if we're investors. Uh, so in the, the next one is a little bit interesting as well. And uh, guys, drop your your questions, notes in the chat as we go. We'll stop here, uh, you know, about the quarter till, and just do some, you know, Q and A and discussions. And Trevor, if you got any comments, jump in um, okay. on on this. And and uh, I got the next one, which is kind of interesting, I think, for you as well, because you're in Austin. And again, these are, I don't make these. This comes from uh, Core Logic. This is not my data. Uh, I still I borrowed this. But this is by certain markets, not every market, just a certain different markets, year over year changes. Um, and you, you can get a feel, right, from August of 22 to August of 23. Some some markets, so like St. Louis is actually up from where it was in 22. Uh, everything else, you know, the trend has continued to be a little bit down from the previous. Um, what I was sharing, like, you know, uh, again, single family homes, this is single family rent index. Again, Austin, you know, slightly down. Uh, compared to the rest of the market right now. And and I could be, you know, it's different indicate things that it went through and it had, maybe it's just adjusting to what it should be versus where it went to. So you got Dallas, again, Dallas still is positive, but down consider a lot from where it was even in uh, the previous years. So, so again, this is the single family homes. Uh, the next one 
uh, talk a little bit about, and then I'll pause here for a little bit, Trevor, and get you to jump in, chime in on some things. But uh, this one I found really interesting. So this is actually a multifamily homes. Uh, this is from RealPage. I don't know if you guys use RealPage. RealPage is one of the big uh, marketing groups out there, companies, and uh, some of the data from them. So, you know, it's it really interesting to see, okay, where we were in 2020, where we were headed, right? What was happening in 2020? And then, and then what happened, you know, okay, boom, now we hit here, 21, uh, biggest time ever and and of, of any ever period, like by substantial amounts, right? In this, and the, by 14, you know, we're up to 14%, which is, if I come here, very similar, right? So the, the single family home and the, the multifamily, you know, they're, they're going to track. So, you know, if you're following one, you're probably good to, you know, one or the other will get you some good data on what's happening in those markets. 22, we started, we talked about it, started flattening out. And then 23 became, you know, leveled out really, really flat, but positive at least, not not below overall, at least positive. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens, you know, 24 really, you know, Maybe it's going to be in here, you know, in that three to four. I've seen, you know, some predictions, you know, around 4% uh, for the year for 24. Trevor, any thoughts, any feedback there? Yeah, I know the one thing, too, is that at no time ever in the history of tracking numbers has the delta from what a mortgage costs in relation to what your rent costs. Um, it, it's significant, like the. The, the delta is, and, and so home ownership is becoming more and more unaffordable and people have no choice but to stay in a rental situation. And I'm not sure if that's gonna adjust anytime soon. Um, and so that gives rents a lot of room to catch up. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yep, sorry, I was trying to yeah. take care of something else, sorry. Uh, so yeah. and. Any, I didn't see if there was any questions or comments in the- We don't have any right now yet, no. No, no comments on this. So, Hi, you know, a lot of this is slide? probably, a lot of it's probably very, you know, known to many people, but what, you know, is to understand is, okay, uh, there was a lot of people buying multifamily in 21. And two things happened in 21, right? People were buying at at this, peak of growth and then also people were buying at a a debt at the lowest but also uh uns or uh without you know buying bridge debt that was not fixed so people were buying you know uh floating debt so the combination of the floating debt and this that where this this growth they you know people thought okay this growth is going to continue like this, they were counting on it. There were, you know, many people underwriting deals at, you know, four to six percent growth, you know, counting that, hey man, this is a slam dunk. And now, you know, if you if you underwrote it for per four to six percent growth in twenty one or even twenty two, you know, that hits that's a heavy hit. That's like half of your a half or more. Uh, reduction to what you were you were underwriting. So, so when you're even as a passive investor, right? Take a look at like asking just the question, like how much growth, how much rent growth are you talking about? You know, and and use some of this as like, is that realistic or not realistic to what the sponsor team is planning and uh, and doing as far as as far as that goes. Um, yeah, okay. and rents did really grow quickly, and they kind of caught up to themselves, and I, I guess you could say stalled out. Um, they certainly weren't increasing; they were plateauing. But I believe very strongly that with this delta between the housing prices, I mean, people that are in a house 
have still not got been able to, they're not out of their houses at this point. Um, and it's just, if you got in at a good low interest rate in your well, but for anybody trying to move into the housing market or have to move from a job change, it's very challenging to get back into a house and you are often forced to get into rental. Yeah, thank you, Trevor. So this one, uh, this is as well, this is something that we we deal with a, a lot in all of our underwriting now. And, uh, you know, this has, this subject has become a lot hotter the last, you know, year, year and a half than it was previously because of a lot of people were actually able to lock in some good rates in, uh, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21. Some, some had some really long IOs. Some may be going into P and I and they're, they're like, so now what's happening is people are selling deals. They're, they're really not selling the deal. They're selling the deal, but they're really selling the, the debt. They're selling the interest rate. So people are buying properties because of the low interest rate. They're buying a property because it's got, you know, maybe it had a three or a 3.5 or a four. And, you know, and we, we shared one earlier. We bought one uh, that is a assumable loan with a, you know, a down in the fours average uh, uh, or with a blended now with us for, for the original loan plus the supplemental. So, you know, is, you know, taking over a, a loan, it's, uh, it actually, and there's some other things to it, you know, uh, Trevor's going to have a great story to share about a loan assumption that didn't go so well sometimes. So loan assumptions, uh, it take as much work as, as a new loan. So don't think, Hey, I'm doing a loan assumption. That's an easy thing. It's, it's a slam dunk. The underwriting of the team is the same. Uh, the underwriting of the deal may not be as stringent, but the underwriting of the team is very stringent and sometimes maybe even more stringent than a new deal. Uh, now, if you now if you're doing a supplemental, and we can talk more about that as well. So you know, supplemental is like, okay, I have a loan at four percent for ten million. Now I and I also want to get. I don't want to raise, you know, 10 million of capital. So I'm going to get a supplemental loan for maybe 4 million. That supplemental loan though, that makes the whole project has to meet the DSCR now. So, so that it has new challenges as well. And uh, again, like I said, it's, it requires approval from the lender. Uh, there's some fees, it's maybe a little less, but, um, and you know, so you get a little closing costs a little lower, interest rates a little lower. New loans, I think everybody knows what happens with the new loans, but you got more flexibility. Uh, you can negotiate your terms a little bit more. Look at the type, you know, how do you want that deal when you exit? Where do you want to be on that debt and that loan? Uh, and again, it requires full underwriting and approval process. I'm gonna. I really want to talk, spend more time on these considerations. Trevor, do you want to share about uh, an experience yeah. on, on a loan <laughs> assumption, a good one and a bad one? Yeah, yeah. So a bad one I'll start with. It was my very first deal as a general partner. Um, we were buying a property and we were doing a loan assumption and the, the, the prepayment penalty was absurd. So there was no way to get out of it. Um, the deal was not making sense using investor capital. So we had arranged a third party prep equity come in behind the loan and make up the difference. And again, if you think about this, your most expensive capital is your investor capital. Your cheapest capital normally is your bank debt. And in the middle, you can have a prep equity and a prep equity sometimes will start at a lower interest rate rise up a little bit so it doesn't completely kill your cash flow. Well, anyways, I was on a deal, six months into the deal, two times adding hard money, and the lender never would approve our third party prep equity behind it. Um, we tried to get a loan, uh, an additional loan, a supplemental loan, they wouldn't allow a supplemental loan. Um, and they kept telling us, well, if you do this, we will do it. And we literally would pay a whole new loan fee, redo everything with the prep equity company, pay all these lawyer bills, 
and six months, um, 350,000 total lost into the deal that we'd sunk in and hard costs that we could not get back. Um, it was a very bad situation. Um, let's talk a little bit about Horizon deal that we just closed on. That particular deal, they allowed a supplemental behind it. So there are a couple of things to consider. The reason the lenders allowed a supplemental behind it was there was the cash flow already on the property to assume it. So we assumed about a $10.2 million loan at 3.78%. We managed to get a 2.250, 257 to be exact. That was at a 7.74 rate, so clearly a huge delta, but the blended rate is still 4.49, so it still made sense. And even though we were out of the interest-only period, if you have a property that's cash flowing and you can manage to make the equity payments and still produce cash flow for your investors, then that makes sense. And we were very fortunate on that particular deal that it really did make sense. We were able to do it. Um, we're still very, very comfortable LTV of around 70%. So it's not like we've overstretched the deal. Um, so we we're very fortunate about that. And I mean, talk about another deal I'm in. The property actually went up in value. They were on a bridge loan, so they had to refinance. It was supposed to be a cash out refinance, but because the loan to value, they were at an 80% bridge and they got a 68% HUD loan, it turned into a cash in refi. Um, so again, she can show with these kind of things that happen, how a deal can definitely change its structure. Um, at the end of the day, it was still a great property, still made sense. Um, this wasn't a massive capital deal. This is a personal example, but it just goes to show all of the variables that can happen on debt. And then, of course, we're all well aware of the people that underwrote, did not ever think that the world would get as crazy it is and you know had three, four, five percent debt. And now they have six, seven, eight percent debt. Um, and that even on interest payments alone, um, they, they're not cash flow positive. Um, so it really can put a strain on it. So those are things that you need to, to look at. Um, and to the answer to the other question, we always underwrite what if, what all options. Um, all, you have to take all options into consideration. Um, often a prepayment penalty, depending on the, what time of the loan, it doesn't make it. But again, I've got some friends, they paid a $1.5 million prepayment penalty and the deal still made sense. Um, so if the numbers work, they work. Um, you just have to look at all of the scenarios to make sure that that you you keep your property in a cash flow positive position. Perfect, perfect. Thanks, Trevor. Hey, uh, Shariah, you joined us. Are you available? Yes, sir. Hey, you want to talk on this? You want to talk a little back on the market? Yeah, let's let's go back to the market a little bit on that first slide and no, one before that. That's okay. Now, um, go back the bullet points. Yes, right there. Right. So if you think about it, at least from the underwriting perspective, right, um, for us, uh, what we take a look at as we get into a deal, as we do the underwriting, the point is what we know, I mean, we ask the question, what separates us versus the next team making the offer, right? And we try to go after from that angle because, you know, on the commercial side, we must know something more than someone who's competing it. And that's how you typically create value. Otherwise, we always compete on the price. Right. So from the massive side, when we underwrite it and we ask the question, OK, the information that we have and available, is it available for everybody? If it is, market is too efficient, then what's the point buying it? Right. So we, we look at it, then we segment it out in two ways. One is the organic growth, which is the market growth. And then the other one is the, the growth at the project level or at the property level. That means if I do the rehab today, do I get some extra $50? or that part is gone versus if I don't do anything, my market goes up uh, and a market pushes the, you know, the rent up. So we kind of separate that out. And then when you get into the project level, the local demographics level, and that's where I think gets really interesting. And you know, as Mike was mentioning that we use tools. So for us, you know, data is gold, right? And you know, the information arbitrage is something that we try to go after and you know, uh, 
So when we store the data, when we underwrite the data in a given location, we try to create our own database. Like example, you know, we are in Houston, we're in DFW. In DFW, we have underwritten more than 200 properties. What it means is that we have collected 200 properties, actual T12s, rental in our database. So right now, if you go back and I, we wanna ask the question, hey, on the North Dallas in this quadrant, we have one property, we're taking a look at it. And we go, we get the Dallas growth, right? Which is in this year, rent growth will be very minimal because and I just saw the slide is spiked up. Uh, two years ago, we had a huge growth. So market is adjusting. But then at the property level, we could see the property around us that we historically underwrote. What is their growth? What is their OPEX? What has been their rent collection? What has been their vacancy? So we can really benchmark at the actual level at the property level. That's the beauty of underwriting hundreds of properties, collecting all the data, having a tool behind it. That is not possible if I just use Excel model and keep all underwriting it, right? So that's that's how we look at it. And that's something, uh, and we ask everybody, when we, when we look at, especially the bigger ticket uh, projects, separate out the rent growth, market driven, versus the rehab driven and then look at the rehab driven and ask the question what is my next doors are getting for the same rehab when i'm done with it and that, if that's a plausible you know rent increase then you go about you know go about modeling it out so that's that's one thing what i will say hey look pay attention both from the lp side both from the gp side extract it out separate them out so you really know which way we go and second we ask the question okay we want to be close to the market what I meant to say, everything is expensive or everything is cheap for a reason, right? If I'm surfing, I wanna put my surfboard on a side where I have typically bigger waves, right? I don't wanna go in a smaller place where I have less of a wave. So on that note, we also take a look at it that given all things equal, right? Given all things equal, do I put our money in a tertiary market? Assuming the price is the same, rent growth is the same, everything is same. Do I put that on a tertiary market or do I put that on a in a core market, right? So that's how we adjust the location as well. So it, it goes a lot in it to the modeling, especially anything about 15, 20 million dollar deals. Uh, and, and that's how we look at it. And that's why we use a lot of tools. We have like four different tools that we use uh, and, uh, and those help us quite a bit. And all the information that we collect it's inside the boundary line, which is anybody within the massive team and our students, we have access to the full data set so we can play. And that's how we create. That's how we create a little bit of information arbitrage when we underwrite the deals. Lona, so yes, that one. Okay, so it it is it's a massive what we do. Uh, what we tend to call we're a finance company first. So we all look, take a position, and are right or wrong. But we we have a position that hey, we take a say in a, in, in this particular year. This is how that's going to play out. We believe, and that's how we position ourselves. And then as the as the information comes about, we we adjust, right? So Q4 last year, we took a position is higher for longer and rate cut will not happen Q1 and Q2. And that's how we took a position December-ish timeframe. That's how been our position up until now that, you know, look at the news, then take the emotion out of the news. Five rate cuts, it was not theoretically yeah. possible. So we took a position, hey, maybe two, uh, maybe three at best, but it's gonna happen during the Q3, Q, Q, I mean, Q3, Q4 timeline. And that's how we do it. And that's how we, you know, uh, kind of position ourselves. And second thing, we took another position like, look, we are not going to buy a property purely on the interest rate, which is just because the rate is low, we're not going to do it. Uh, we've been saying it for a year and a half. And finally, some of the people kind of caught up with this. It is interesting because if we think about it, 4% interest rate sounds really awesome. Right, which is true, four percent, very cheap. Versus, you get a new loan today, five and a seven, right? Uh, and that's because you know deal kind of kills it. But what it does is, if you think about it, we are higher for longer, but it's not gonna go down to four percent. I mean, this is almost certain for next two three years, right? Let's take the business plan assumption. So, what happens if we buy a property at a three and a half percent interest rate today, and we gotta run the asset, improve the NOI? so that I can sell it at a 5% interest rate three years down the way. So that whole erosion of the NOI due to interest rate increase, that goes on our shoulder. 
right? We have to pay for it. That means we're going to work for free to go to increase the NOI just to just to uh, you know just to sell at a five percent, and then we have to work double to get paid, right? To increase value. So we look at it. That's why we run every single at least two or three scenarios, which is what if what if we bought the property today at the current rate, and then we compare that with what the loan assumption looked like. Then we said, okay, we need to strike a course, something in between, but we're not going to give all the profit back to the seller because we're, we're not working for free, right? We're not buying the loan. We are buying an operational value add. So there's a premium for that. And then there's a small premium for the interest rate, but we should not pay a full premium for the interest rate. So it gets really tricky. It breaks a lot of heart, but we are very adamant about it. And that's why we are biasing towards all the assets four and a half percent or more, right? It blended. So the last deal that we did, loan assumption was below four, but we did a supplemental above seven. Blended is close to five. We liked it because we I'm close to the market. I am buying a property, which is almost 5% compared to a new debt, five and a seven. So when I sell, when we sell three years down the way, we're selling it at a 5%. So interest rate has no impact on my buying price and the sell price. So all the value add that we're going to do, that's a pure value add. So that's how we kind of took a look at it. And you know, that's why anything someone said, hey, it's a three years loan assumption, you got 4%, fanta- or 3% is fantastic. It was like, nope, it's fantastic for the seller, not for us. And that's how we take a look at it. So Mike, back to you. I added a little bit more flavor. Yeah, uh, no, I think it's, that, that was great. I appreciate uh, Shreyer. And uh, it's probably really where we'll wrap up. I think the last, Slide. It's just a little bit, kind of a little bit mix of the last few things, and just for people to think about, right? Um, you know, uh, just you know, understand the the journey and understand, you know, the uh, the value of what you're getting into and what people are, you know, telling you or selling to you, right? Because, you know, if I buy a hundred units, you know, does that mean that I'm going to make 20,000 a month in income, you know, uh, it, there could be ways that that is true statement. And there are other ways that that may not be a true statement, right? If I can buy it all myself and do different things, then all that money comes to me of, of the rents and things and, and however much I, you know, can keep the expenses down. But if I'm buying it as a syndication, then you know, 70% of that, you know, some of that money goes to the investors. And then I probably am doing a GP, like, you know, I may get 50% of the GP and everybody else gets 50%. And so it, it, you know, just as relative to what the real structure of the whole deal is, it's not just, hey, yeah, if I buy that many units, I'm going to make this much money. So that was one of the things I heard I heard this week somebody was sharing with me and uh, wanted just to talk about that. Uh, one of the things, other pieces, and I'll let Schreier kind of expand on this a bit, but, you know, I think now in the next, you know, for a little bit, expect people, you know, are going to be going, you know, for higher returns because, uh, or at least promising higher returns because they're, they're you know, everybody's out there competing with different, uh, you know, other products out there, there's, there's real estate, there's other products out there besides real estate, you know, that, uh, and with interest rates higher, you know, that you're, you're, you gotta, you know, give a bit better, you know, maybe you gotta give a better return or people are looking to give a better return. So just look at that. And, um, uh, uh, last thing I think is you're looking through like what you're doing, you know, leverage experience from other industries as well. So, you know, look at capital markets across other business sectors, not just real estate to get a, get an idea of what, you know, what they're doing, how they're doing to, to, to compare with yourself, like startups, tech fund, tech funds, et cetera. Right. Uh, Or as you go around. So those were just a few things I wanted to add. Shreyer, go ahead if you. So, you know, uh, from the help, like we are, we invest in all of our deals as well, right? We we invest, we work, we have you know, a lot of things going. We have earnings, and we have to deploy just like almost all of our investors, right? 
And we, again, it's a finance company first, massive, it's a finance company first. We got to take a financial view of it and we have to be a little bit more academic about it, right? When the interest rate was three, three and a half percent, it was almost like free money. Uh, then it is okay to offer LPs 12, 13, 14%. And then if market gives you a bonus, it's a bonus, right? Uh, we never said that, hey, I gave you 30%. That was all me. It's never the case, right? It's always market plus individual. But so typically, if you take out the market out, look at the baseline, what we call it at a 3%, just think about it. Fed rate was 3% or Fed rate was zero. We borrowed money from the bank at a 3%. And PREF got 12%, LP got 17, 18%. More risk you take, more you make. It's risk adjusted return. Now, bed rate is 5.5%. PREF is 14, 15%. LPs got to get 17, 18, 19%. Otherwise, LP should not be LPs, right? And oftentimes, you see a deal from the LP perspective where we're saying LPs make 15%. Then the question becomes why am I taking credit risk? Why am I getting for 15% taking so much of a risk? Because I am an LP, LP has an upside risk and a downside risk I'm behind the bank, right? So we are very objective about it, that hey, if and our money is everybody's money, just like our money, we wanna make sure the money gets a return that is adjusted for the market. And that also pushes the second question is that just one type of deal at a given area at a given time, those days are gone for a little bit. So we have to really be flexible about to make sure that money makes the right amount of return. Uh, which is also why you know, we do many things, right? Again, we are, our job is to create value for the money and a solid return adjusted for the market. If it's multifamily today, fantastic. It is a retail tomorrow, okay? You know, let it be. If it's land day after after, no big deal, right? It, it doesn't mean that we should not discount the what is the market return, right? And I can go to bank, get 5%, almost guarantee. Right. So if I come to it as a bank outside the bank, I should get seven, eight percent. That's how we design the pref. And then for the LP side, we're very, you know, very um, intentional about what kind of a project we do. And that puts a pressure on us uh, to make sure that we find the right kind of project. Uh, so you'll see that. So as an LP perspective, you know, if, if I have a deal today that I'm going in at a 12, 13, 14, 15 percent event, unless it's a solid class A, and you have a, you need some bigger depreciation, um, just analyze the deal a little bit extra, right? So that's on the uh, on the return side, right? You should expect a little bit more. Then the leveraging experience from the other industry, we're LPs as well, right? So we we have to make a decision: Do I go buy stock? Do I go do a CD? Or do I do real estate? Or do I do all or some or blend it in? And, you know, be objective about it. Uh, be true to the system who you are, and then you kind of go about it. The one thing we suggest you don't do, which I did, I used to work at Shell. My wife used to work at Exxon. And we thought we knew you know, upstream, downstream domains. So what happened under the name of, I know it a little bit, which we had some idea because of the level that we worked in. I have Exxon in my portfolio. I have Shell in my portfolio. I got Mustang in my portfolio. I got TechTip in my portfolio. Guess what? I'm all in all in gas. Under the name of de-risking, I have fully risked myself. So don't do that. <laughs> Step out, separate that out, and, and kind of play with the money. That's where the point is. Look, yeah, everybody has a unique background. Don't double down on your background all the time unless you are knee deep in it, right? All for all of us GPs, uh, this massive side, we're in the real estate, but not in the same asset class. They don't jive in the same frequency. Not at the seventh, you know, you know, even though we are in the domain, we have de-risked quite a bit within the domain. And you should, you know, all we say all of our friends, you should be hit them and you should model the same way. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. Number one, nothing is risk free. Absolutely nothing, right? It doesn't matter. I love you guys or not. I'll take your money or not. You know, money is money. Nothing is risk free. Nothing is guaranteed. Our role at this on the massive side is to give you the downside protection the most, right? Uh, Mike, Sanjay, and I, we all are engineers. We work in the production facility. We call it fail everything first, then you pass it. So you know where the failure factors come about. Don't pass a project, then you don't know what the failure points are, right? So nothing is risk-free. Education is important. Being passive, to me, is like actively passive, right? There's nothing absolute passive. You are spending some time to get into know us, get to know the deal, and due diligence is a must. I absolutely... And if you ask me, my God wrenches, all my friends call, hey, Shira, I know you, you sent me the email. This is my money. As long as you invest, I'm investing. I was like, no, don't do that. 
go, go read the dang thing, right? Ask some questions, then give the benefit of the doubt. So due diligence to us is very cool. Love when you guys ask the questions, follow the process. There is a reason for a process. And then, you know, and for us, it's to be active and consistent, right? We all bought stocks. We all lost a little bit of money. We all made some money as well. As, as long as net, net, we are on the positive, that is the whole idea. And last but not the least, time is your best friend. So take a little longer horizon, play it out, build your basket, keep being consistent, active about it, follow the process, proper due diligence, learn, then go for the risk. Awesome. Thank you. So, yeah, thank per you perfect and... timing. We're right at the top of the hour. Um, and so we're, we're definitely going to keep this going. I do want to mention that next week, if you love me, you will show up on Valentine's night. Okay. Yeah. So we're talking about why do we love real estate? We realize you may have some conflicts, but we hope that you'll come and join us. But uh, we decided since it was February the 14th, uh, we had to talk about uh, why do we love real estate. Um, and I think if you spend any time with anyone on the massive team, uh, you have no doubt that we love real estate and we love what we do. We love helping people learn and uh, be able to gain their financial independence. We all put our own money in. We believe real estate is, is, is the way to create generational wealth. So. And thanks, and everybody, for coming.